we are good. I think we are good. Uh, welcome everyone to this episode on Datadog on eBPF. Uh, Datadog is a series of webinars that we are preparing here at Datadog, where we invite engineers who work on a daily basis on building Datadog itself uh, to share the knowledge about a particular technology or uh, processes that they're following uh, to build Datadog. Uh, today we have a super exciting episode on eBPF. If you want to watch any of the previous one or you want to catch up with the recording of this one, you can visit datadoghq.com and you will see the, all the previous one. And um, as soon as we are able to edit the video for this one, this one as well. Uh, just a housekeeping item, uh, we plan to leave enough time at the very end for questions. Uh, so you should have a Q&A button in your Zoom client. So you don't have to wait until the very end to, to ask your question. If you have a question throughout the content, uh, feel free to leave there the question. And at the end, we will be able to hopefully answer all of them or going through all of them. Uh, good, so um, this talk obviously is not about Datadog itself. It's about how we build Datadog and how we use, uh, in this case, eBPF um, as part of, of what we do at Datadog. But just so you know, uh, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve observability of their infrastructure and applications, uh, including uh, network monitoring and security monitoring, which are two of the use cases uh, for eBPF that we're going to be talking about today. Um, my name is Ara Pulida. I'm a technical evangelist here at Datadog. Um, I'm one of the uh, co-organizers of this uh, Datadog on series. So if you have any any feedback or you want to uh, propose a topic that you want us to cover, uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter on, on my mail uh, and we will be happy to, to see that feedback. But the important people today here are Guillaume and Lee. Uh, Guillaume, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks. So hi, my name is Guillaume. Um, I'm on the security agent team at Datadog and I've been at Datadog for about three years now. Um, and on the security agent team, uh, we try to use eBPF to build um, a new generation of security tools. And Lee? Hello, um, I'm Lee. I'm a team lead on the network performance monitoring team. And as the team name may suggest, we use eBPF to build network performance monitoring at Datadog. Fantastic. Um, so before we dive in into eBPF and, and how uh, Lee and Guillaume are using it uh, in their day-to-day -day work, uh, just a few notes on data scale. Uh, so we are a monitoring company. We have 12, uh, more than 12,000 customers. And obviously we have to instrument uh, our customers' infrastructure that adds up to millions of hosts and translate that in trillions of data points per day. So needless to say, uh, being very performant when gathering that data is super important for us, uh, which takes us to eBPF and one of the reasons why we use eBPF. Um, and before uh, Lee and Guillaume uh, go a little bit deeper on what it is and how it works, uh, just a small definition for those of you who never heard of eBPF before. Uh, basically, it's a set of technologies that help you run sandbox programs in the Linux kernel without having to change, either change kernel source code or having to load kernel models. So it allows you to run um, kernel space uh, code without having to do um, things like loading kernel models, which is um, a little bit insecure. But the funny thing about eBPF, which has been uh, becoming super popular in the past five years, is that the technology behind eBPF, at least the base of that technology, has been in the Linux kernel uh, for quite a quite some time. Um, and and Lee is going to give us a little bit of one-on-one history on eBPF and and how it came to be. Absolutely. So um, as Ara mentioned, BPF started out in the Linux kernel all the way back in 1992. Back then, it was uh, simply a bytecode and an in-kernel interpreter, and it allowed you to define functions that went from basically a packet to uh, a Boolean, and the Boolean would say whether or not it matched the packet. And this was used primarily in packet capture tools like TCP dump. BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. And you'll notice this talk is about eBPF, and this is just BPF. 
uh, when the E was added, that was a few years later. And if we fast forward to 2014, we can see that's when all of that work started. So back in 3.15, which was in 2014, this is kernel version 3.15 of the Linux kernel, the BPF instruction set was optimized and a JIT was added. So instead of interpreting this architecture agnostic bytecode, now BPF runs on native machine code for whatever architecture you're running on for, for the common architectures. There was also in kernel version 3.18, a BPF system call added. And this BPF system call is how most modern use cases of BPF interact with the BPF system. So after 2014, things really exploded and, and things started moving really fast. And if we jump forward to 2016, a lot of the features that the Datadog agent runs on that we'll be talking about today were added. So in uh, kernel version 4.1, kprobes were added. Kprobes are an in-kernel API used to attach to any function in the kernel. So anything in the kernel source code, you can instrument with kprobes. In 4.4, perf buffers were added to eBPF. Perf buffers are a type of data structure which lets your eBPF programs be written in a much more um, event-driven manner. And we'll talk about that a bit more. In 4.7, trace points were added and trace points, we think of them as sort of a ABI stable version of kprobes. In 4.8, XDP, which stands for Express Data Path, allowed eBPF programs to operate right before a packet left or entered a machine. And this unlocked a lot of capabilities that underlie technologies like Cilium. Uh, Cilium is, is a Kubernetes CNI, which uh, we use quite a bit at Datadog. We won't talk about it much today, but it's, it is very important. And in 4.10, cgroup support was added, and this lets you apply network security policies to various containers. Um, the kernel didn't stop at 4.10, and neither does eBPF. Every subsequent Linux release included more and more points where BPF can integrate into the kernel. But uh, this, is, this is where we're choosing to, to stop. But there's tons more work happening and much more to come. Great, thanks, thanks for that, Lee. Uh, so before we before we we talk about how it works, how everything, how the technology uh, works, um, I wanted to to ask both of you to your your thoughts on why you think um, why the hype, why suddenly every Linux conference is a, it's almost an eBPF conference. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's using it. Um, Guillaume, do you do you want to go first? On sure, your, sure. Your thoughts. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there, there are a lot of different reasons, right? But I think for me, the most important one is stability. Um, and, and I'm especially thinking about, uh, you know, security use cases. So for example, like a lot of runtime security tools out there um, will require a very high level of trust, um, you know, for the clients. Uh, um, compared to, to you know to to their vendors and um and and yeah and the ability to say hey so yeah i'm gonna be root on your infrastructure but i have like you know this insurance that i'm not going to uh you know break your prod or break your instances because i, I have a kernel module or whatever and and the ability to say whatever solution i'm going to deploy in, in your infrastructure is going to be stable and will not you know uh, cause outages is something that is very important and this is like one of the very um you know one of the most important benefits, I guess, um, about eBPF. Yeah, and, and building on top of that, in terms of what it's replacing, uh, the stability is really important. So it's, it's a replacing sort of three, there are sort of three alternatives to eBPF that, that we might be using for observability use cases like, like Datadog does. And so the first is relying on user space instrumentation, which can be super patchy. Um, like not every user space is going to be instrumented the same way. The other is relying on older kernel APIs, which are not uh, always exposing everything that you need. And then the third option is writing your own kernel driver. And doing that is uh, very dangerous. So if you mess up, you might crash the underlying system, which we don't want to do for any of our customers. Good. Thanks. Thanks for that, that insight. Um, so let's let's dive in. Um, so how does everything work? Uh, Lee? Do you want to give us a high level overview? Sure. So uh, there are roughly three steps to loading eBPF into your, into your kernel. So usually you start with some kind of user code. We tend to use C. 
there are also ways to use Python and custom DSLs. Because we use C, we also use uh, Clang, which is the compiler that allows you to turn C into eBPF bytecode. So once we start with our bytecode, we use Clang to compile our C into an ELF file. And that file contains both the code that will run as well as descriptors for maps. Maps are data structures that are particular to eBPF. They're regions of memory that can be written and read to from both user space and kernel space. So maps are the main way that BPF programs, eBPF programs communicate with, with the outside world. So once we have this uh, ELF file, we need to actually load it into the kernel. So all of that is done with this single BPF system call and we use many of those system calls. So it's a monolithic system call, which means that it has one argument uh, at the beginning that says, this is what this BPF call is doing. And then every subsequent argument changes based on what that first argument is. So the first time you call BPF, we load the maps. So these are all the maps that were described in the ELF file. So this is one call to BPF per map. And the first argument that we use to the system call is BPF map create. Um, the next thing you do once you have created all these maps is to load the program itself. So the ELF file contains the, the program, which is the, the actual instructions that run, but those instructions reference maps that don't yet exist. So we use a loader program to basically rewrite the instructions to reference the maps that we've just created with that, that first BPF system call. Once we've done that rewriting, we do yet another system call to load the instructions into the kernel. That BPF system call runs through two important processes. The first is verification, which makes sure that all those safety guarantees that, that we were talking about are actually met. And then the second is JIT compilation, which uh, we also touched on a little bit, which makes sure the program runs, runs fast. Um, so the last step is once you have this program loaded into the kernel, it, it just sort of lives there, but it isn't doing anything. You need to attach it somewhere. So the, there's a program file descriptor and you need to put that file descriptor somewhere. So depending on what kind of program it is, you do something different with it. So if it is a socket filter, you might attach it to a socket with a set socket call. For an XDP program, there's a netlink interface that you can load. And for K-probes, there is a sysfs interface that lets you associate a given uh, eBPF program with a kernel function. So it really depends on what kind of use case you're, you're doing with eBPF. And that's how you load um, an eBPF program. Uh, one thing I did want to talk about was the verifier. So we've been talking all about how eBPF is really safe and you're not going to bring down a system by running eBPF. And the way that this is ensured is by making sure that all programs that you load into the kernel have a particular or meet these uh, criteria. So there are a few criteria. Um, the first is the program must be a DAG or a directed acyclic graph. This basically means you can't use recursion and you can't use go to. There are no unchecked dereferences. So you, if you want to dereference a pointer, you first need to check that it's not null. There are no bounded loops. Um, this was relaxed as of kernel version 5.2, but even as of, sorry, you could have no loops before kernel version 5.2, and then after kernel version 5.2, you could have loops, but they, they needed to be bounded. Um, and then you also cannot have any unreachable code and your code needs to be a certain size. So all this makes sure that your DPF programs will run at a certain speed um, and will not crash your machine. Good. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, so we, we are talking about, about uh, writing these this programs in, in C or with C with its limitations on the, the, for the verifier. Uh, but all, Datadoc, uh, all the code in Datadog agents is, is Go or most of it is Go. Um, so how we bind those two together? 
I can take this one over. Um, so yeah, so basically uh, we have our own eBPF library. Um, and um, you know, as, as Lee just described, there are a lot of different steps to load an eBPF program. And it's actually pretty uh, complicated, right? There are many pitfalls, many edge cases. Um, and it's not just you know, loading a program, program in the kernel and then calling the right hook bunk. You actually have to set up the entire thing. And there are many different program types and those different program types have different setups. And it can be really a nightmare to, to handle all of these into one single pro pro um, sorry, pro uh, project, such as the uh, data document. Um, so yeah, so overall, the, the uh, BPF API is not really friendly, and, uh, and it's hard to collaborate with other people if you do not you know, uh, agree on one specific way of handling BPF programs. And basically, this is why we created uh, the BPF library. Um, yeah, so the goal was to unify our BPF usage and make sure that we all follow the same BPF lifecycle within the agent. Um, so again, the uh, agent is in Go and the BPF library is entirely in Go as well, which means that um, you know, once you have compiled the BPF program, you do not need any more um, you know, bindings such as Sego or uh, um, de de dependency on the on libcc, for example. Um, so what we added in the DataDog eBPF library is a bunch of features that I'm going to, to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but basically, it helps us share eBPF programs um, uh, with the different teams that collaborate on uh, the DataDog agent and uh, share also different maps and, and you know, collaborate together and know how the other people work and what they do and be able to work together on eBPF. So all the code is... Um, uh, open source, of course. Um, so basically, the, the library was initially a fork of Cilium, but then we added a lot of, a lot of logic um, to, to handle the BPF programs and, uh, and you know, create some kind of uh, um, you know, common uh, BPF program lifecycles. And uh, so, this so this logic, we call it the manager. And each manager for, all, I mean, we have one manager for um, each different product that uses eBPF. And the manager is in charge of uh, handling everything related to eBPF. So you don't have to do anything. We also have a lot of examples um, in that uh, repository. So feel free to check it out if you want to, uh, to learn how to use uh, different program types. Um, yeah, so let's deep dive a little bit into what the eBPF library does and um, what it can do for you. So the first step, as Lee said, was um, you know you need to have your compiled eBPF programs and you need to load them into the kernel. So the eBPF library will parse the ELF format, so you don't have to parse anything yourself, and will um, you know out of the uh, raw bytecode that you will provide will. Um, um, you know, select the different programs that you have, the different maps, and uh, you'll be able to do a lot of things uh, on those programs and maps. So for example, you'll be able to do constants additions. Um, so I'm going to talk about this later, but this is a way to, um, you know, put constants into your program at runtime without having to rebuild the entire thing. Um, you can also change programs, ma um, change map parameters, and, um, and you know, again, share a, the same map between different programs or share the same prog uh, program between different projects. <laughs> Um, yeah, so step two is uh, to attach your BPF programs. So once again, the BPF library handles everything for you. So you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, what is, what, what kind your BPF programs are, uh, how you should set them up, uh, what, you know, parameters you need to, to have or what um, system called um, API you should call to, to set up your programs. Everything is done for you and out of the box. So really, you, really, you don't have to do anything. We also added um, a validation so that once you have loaded all your k probes, um, the BPF library will be able to tell you if everything went well or if some programs were not loaded properly. And this is very important because for um, programs or sorry for projects such as the security agent, we have a lot of different hook points, and it's sometimes hard for us to know if all the um, hook points are properly set up. And again, because this is a security tool for us, um, a hook point that was not properly set up might end up in a bypass for the agent. So this is very important for us to know if everything was set up correctly or not. And the last point is, um, so this is something very um, common with eBPF, but just wanted to, to, to say a few words about it. Um, so eBPF has, has um, you know, a feature called maps. So a lot of different maps are available and have different you know, um, functionalities that you can use. But overall, the uh, TLDR is uh, you can access the, those maps from, from kernel space or from um, user space. And two um, maps, two types of maps are really important. So the first one is hash maps, and the other one is perf, 
graph buffers. So hash maps is simply a hash map, as, uh, <laughs> as the name says. And um, you can use them to, for example, collect statistics or um, you know, metadata about something that's going on in the kernel. And then you can use perf buffers to send events back uh, to user space in real time. So this is very interesting for us because this is how, for example, on the security use case, we send um, security events back to user space. Um, yeah, so that's it for the uh, ABPF library. Great, um, thanks, thanks. Um, before before we, we move to the next uh, to the next topic, uh, Guillaume. Uh, so basically, that library is open source. Anyone, even outside Datadog, could could find it useful for their own projects. Yeah, absolutely. And also, if you want to learn about ABPF, I think uh, it's a, it's a good place to have you know examples for all the different uh, program types. Uh, personally speaking, it's something I've been struggling with at the very beginning. You know, like have one single point where you can test everything and uh, you know learn about ABPF in general. So yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to contribute, please feel free to to post uh, pull requests and uh, yeah. Good. Um, so this. Uh... Obviously, this is running. All this code is running on, on kernel space, and different kernels will have um, different behavior. Uh, so, how do you handle the thing of building a, a program that that works on several different kernels? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as you said, eBPF programs run in kernel space, and um, when you you know when you collect data from kernel space, this means that you actually read the structures in kernel memory, which means you read the structures of the kernel itself. And from one kernel to the other, from one distribution to the other, from uh, one competition flag to the other, uh, you will eventually have different offsets. And, and those offsets make your life really hard when you want to have you know, one solution fits all. Um, and, and this is why uh, we currently have two ways of dealing with this. So the first one is kernel offset guessing, and we'll talk about the other one, which is runtime competition. Um, so, even within the distribution, this is really a problem because um, you will not be able, so there are basically two things that you need to, to make sure that you get right, right? So the first one is the different hook points because they may change from one uh, version to the other. And the other one is the different hub sets. So, um, the, the solution that we use today for networking, as, at least, is uh, kernel offset guessing. So what I mean by that is, uh, can you maybe go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So um, you, you can actually guess at runtime the different offsets of those structures I was talking about in a, a two-step process. So the first step is simply to uh, load um, a specific kernel uh, EPPF program that we use specifically to guess the kernel offsets. So this program will uh, has will have just one role, which is you know try to hook on um, on hook points that we care about and try to guess uh, comparing with known values uh, which offset is required to to get the data from the kernel. So system probe will you know load this first program, attach it to the different UDP or TCP uh, hook points that we care about, and then system probe regenerate a lot of UDP and TCP traffic with known IPs and known ports. And because DBPF programs will be triggered and will access the data in those system calls, um, the, the, our programs will be able to compare, you know, well, like try offset zero, for example, and then compare the data that it gets using um, XYZ offsets and make sure that, you know, increment this offset until they get the right one with the values that we know about. And once those programs do, they push the right offsets in a kernel map. And then step two, um, if you go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Step two is, okay, so now you have a kernel map with all the right offsets, right? So system probe will pull all the, those offsets um, out of the, the kernel map, will override the different constants inside your uh, prod eBPF programs, and eventually push the right programs in kernel space. So what this means is eventually you will not have any maps, anything, um, you know, your programs will be tailored at runtime to the specific version of your kernel and to the specific uh, offsets that, that are required for, um, you know, the right data to be collected. So that's option right, one, right? Um, but so it works well for network and it has worked well so far. But the problem is this only works if you can do this mechanism of kernel uh, offset guessing. And that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, structures are too deep in th inside the kernel memory or you don't have, you know, an easy hook point to, to, um, to brute force the right offsets. So this would not work. And eventually we had to move on to runtime compilation. So, um, 
basically the idea is pretty simple. <laughs> Instead of uh, you know having pre-compiled uh, eBPF programs and then try to guess the offsets, well, you can also just you know compile the offsets at runtime using the kernel headers. And um, and yeah, once you have your compiled eBPF programs, do all the logic all over again to load and attach your programs. So. Um, if you want to, to take it step by step, um, instead of um, of uh, you know um, of uh, shaping your uh, compile eBPF programs um, to the the to your uh, instance when you want to deploy the the DDoG agent, what we do is we ship the eBPF code. Um, and then we use uh, a library that embedded that we embedded into the DDoG agent to um, simply compile the code. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Thanks. And um, so we took special steps to make sure that uh, we do not compile everything and also that we do not ship the entire Chrome library, right? So we only want to be able to, to compile eBPF programs. And also we want to make sure that we only compile the eBPF programs that were shipped uh, with the agent instead of, uh, you know, letting potential, uh, potential uh, attacker, um, you know, compile whatever programs they want. So we have this specific uh, mechanism to make sure that we only compile what we know about and what we want. And then, yeah, we do uh, all the logic all over again. We, uh, once we have the eBPF bytecode, we load the programs and then we use the library to um, attach the different programs to the right hook points. Sounds difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So let's let's diving into the, the two data log use cases uh, that we that we are going to be talking about today. Um, the um, these are not the only ones. Uh, like Lee mentioned, for example, we are using Stellium in our uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, not the only ones, uh, but the ones that we are going to be talking about today are network monitoring, uh, where we can basically get visibility into your network traffic. On or, or of infrastructure, no matter the containers or VMs or something else. Uh, so, Lee, do you want us to give us an overview of, of how network monitoring as a product works in, in Datadog? Yeah, absolutely. So, network monitoring captures all the TCP and UDP metadata on a host. It doesn't intercept the packets themselves, so it, it's not sniffing any data, but it is capturing metadata. And that includes things like the send and receive volumes, the latency and retransmits for TCP connections, uh, the connection rate for also for TCP, and then also the source and destinations of those connections. On our back end, we take those source and destinations, which are just of the form of basically IP and ports, and add even more useful information like tags about hosts and containers. And then we let you slice and dice that data to find out interesting things about your traffic. So in this particular view that we're looking at, we're seeing traffic based on the source and destination service, uh, where service is a tag that is attached to some of our hosts. So uh, you can see in the top row, for example, that send email, Redis queue, and Django email are communicating with each other. And in the last hour, we sent 36 megabytes. Um, but you can also do all sorts of interesting queries that use groups other than service. So for example, we could answer a question like, for a given host, what is the breakdown of traffic by AZ? Or for a given pod, um, what Kubernetes clusters are those pods talking to? Which is, is interesting if you have several uh, Kubernetes clusters, um, questions of that nature. We also provide, uh, in addition to the tabular view, a graph view, which lets you understand the network topology at a faster glance. So this is the same data that we were looking at just before, but um, it may be easier to understand for that. Cool. So the, the agent that gathers all of that is also open source? That's right. Um, so it's all open source and inside the uh, Datadog agent package. Um, you can check out the code uh, at, this, at this link. Um, and talk a bit about how it works as well. Um, so it all happens within the system probe. The system probe is a subcomponent of the data dog agents. It's a sub process which runs at a slightly elevated privilege that allows the program to load BPF features. Um, and this, this diagram shows the network specific part. And like most BPF applications, there's both a user space portion and a uh, BPF portion. If we could go to the next slide. Um, so uh, for the user space portion, this is sort of the, the outer shell. 
So the first thing it does is it loads uh, BPF maps and then it starts up an HTTP server that other agents can communicate with to ask for uh, connection information. So there's a main control loop where basically a second agent process pings the connections endpoint. When we get a request on that connections endpoint, we know about the set of BPF maps that the uh, BPF portion of the system probe is writing to. We read stuff out of those maps. We do a little bit of formatting and then return data about all the connections that happened since the last call to that connections endpoint. And all that happens in user space and it happens um, every, every 30 seconds or so. And then for the eBPF portion, that's where uh, a lot of the, the sort of really interesting stuff happens. So the eBPF portion is built on k -perms. We use the offset guessing approach that, that we were just talking about to figure out how to get a lot of information from structures within the Linux network stack. So stuff like uh, sock pointer, uh, flow four, um, and stuff like that. We intercept every call to functions like TCP send message, UDP send message, um, IP make socket buffer, um, several. And whenever we get information about a new message sent or a new message received, we write that information to a map. Um, and those maps are the things that get pulled by that user space process that, that I was just talking about. Um, we also use a perf buffer for connections that live and die between calls to connections. So recall that perf buffers are these um, maps that are sort of real time. So they act very similar to Go channels where you have user space subscribing to events and you have uh, eBPF programs sending events on those perf buffers. And uh, that's, that's about it. Good. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Lynn. That's, that's networking. Uh, so what about uh, the second use case that we have for uh, eBPF uh, today, which is runtime security, uh, basically monitoring the ability to detect security threats on runtime, at runtime and not uh, code time. Uh, so Guillaume, do you, do you want us to give us an overview of the product first and then how you use eBPF to, to achieve those goals? Sure. So um, today we do two things uh, for runtime security. So the first one is file integrity monitoring. So file integrity monitoring is the ability to detect when a specific file is being opened or modified. Um, so this is very important for two different use cases. The first one is compliance. Many compliance standards, such as you know PCI and so on, um, will require that the you know the key files and the key uh, configuration files of your infra infrastructures. Uh, infrastructure are being uh, monitored, and the reason for that is you don't want you know an attacker uh, you know adding new users or modifying you know passwords to your database or accessing um, you know sensitive uh, secrets without you knowing it, right? So that's why it's a very important feature for uh, compliance. And the other important feature, and, and also um, what we use it for today, is runtime security. And what I, I say by what I mean by uh, runtime security is um, technically opening a sensitive file will be one, um, you know, a breadcrumb, like a, a clue that an attacker will leave behind, saying that um, you know someone was there, someone did something shady, and like you want to be alerted ab uh, about it. And 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 the security team will, you know probably trigger an ESR to understand what's going on. So ESR is a, a event security review. So basically it's when a security team tries to understand um, what happened and if uh, there is you know, uh, sensitive data that was accessed, for example. Um, so something that we do with the file integrity monitoring product as well is we provide a lot of context. So comparing with other file integrity monitoring products out there, um, we provide a lot of context for, again, for the security team to understand what's going on and act faster upon the alert. Um, so it's, you know, it's really the difference between a runtime uh, solution compared to a periodical check, um, which is what most of people do when they think about uh, file integrity monitoring. So um, yeah, so that's the first part of the product. And the second part of the product is process execution monitoring. Um, so again, the, the goal here is to have a lot of insight into what's going on on a host and, and what's going on, uh, you know, and what the kernel is actually doing. So um, the, 
what we look for is basically malicious processes or malicious process patterns. So for example, uh, if you have an Apache uh, web, web uh, server, um, if you ever see you know, a bash shell um, that is spawned by one of the Apache threads, uh, this is technically a very bad you know, <laughs> signal that you never want to see in production because this might mean that someone for some reason figured out a way to uh, you know, trigger a web shell and, and have access to uh, your uh, infrastructure. So this is what we do um, with the process execution monitoring. And again, one very important piece of context uh, with, we provide with this product is the entire um, you know, tree of processes that spawn this process. And this is something that is very complicated to do um, because the, the, you know, the actual process tree that is given by the kernel is not always the one you care about because some processes might die and so on. So what we do is uh, we, we keep the entire life uh, cycle of the process and the entire life cycle of the, the, the parents of each process. Um, yeah, so again, you'll, you're gonna have a very specific um, uh, context about uh, what happened on your host and, uh, and you know, how, how to uh, react upon it and how to, to deal with uh, the potential alerts that was triggered by process execution monitoring. So um, yeah, we have based like, Again, what we focus about, what we focus on with the the EBPF here, and what we focus on when we um, work on runtime security is um, we want to change how uh, security teams deal with runtime security today. Um, we want to provide as much data as we can to. Uh, and also keeping in mind performances and stability, right? But we want to provide as much context as we can so that we reduce the amount, uh, reduce the signal to noise ratio. And what this means is every single alert that we we um, we emit should uh, you know be uh, uh, actable upon, right? You should be able to do something about it. You should be able to understand what's going on behind it, and you should be able to know exactly if this is bad or if it's fine. So. Um, and a very important uh, reason why performance stability is so important for us is uh, because coverage is you know, re what really matters here. Um, and you can't have good coverage if your solution is not installed everywhere, and you can't ins install the solution everywhere if the overhead is, too, is simply too high, right? So that's why EBPF is a, is a very good fit for both use cases and for security in general. Um, so, all of the code um, is, so you can go to the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> so again, all of the code, just like uh, the, the network product, all of the code is open source. Um, you can like, you know, have a look at what we do, how we do it um, in the uh, PKG security folder of the data code agent, agents repository. Um, yeah, and again, contributions are welcomed. And if you uh, want to have a look at, at uh, how we, we do all those cool features, um, just have a look. <laughs> So um, yeah, we do. So the way it works is, first of all, you not you want to understand what the clients want, right? And you want to understand exactly, um, you know, what you're looking for inside the host and what you're looking for when it comes to file integrity monitoring or uh, process execution monitoring. So those two um, rules that you can see are. So the first one is about file integrity monitoring, and the second one is about process monitoring. So the first one will trigger an alert whenever a file in var log, for example, is being opened or modified and, um, and it was also by a specific process. And the second rule is, um, is basically the use case that was the, I was describing before, which is uh, you want to be alerted whenever a bash shell or a, you know, a cron tab is, is started uh, based on a process that should never start these kind of processes. So uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's Postgres. And um, from those two rules, what we do is we want to optimize as much as possible the uh, you know the work that we'll have to do uh, to 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 trigger an alert based on those different um, expressions, and and the way we do it is um, we we actually compute uh, you know policies and uh, sorry uh, filters that we will. Uh, push in kernel space to filter the, the data and process the data um, as early as possible. So at a very high level, um, the way it works is we have two parts. So, so the first one is everything related to BPF will be in system probe. As Lee said, this is where all the BPF stuff happens um, you know, in, in the data log agent. And um, the second part is the security agent itself. And what this one does is basically just forwards the, uh, all the alerts um, you know, generated by system probe to the security monitoring product. 
And again, um, the, the runtime security product is included um, you know, with the uh, security monitoring product because uh, this is a good way to correlate your uh, alerts with other uh, you know, signals that your infrastructure might have generated. And you can have you know, powerful queries that makes uh, you know, cloud infrastructure alerts with runtime security alerts. So in order to, to have, uh, you know, to have file integrity monitoring working or to uh, do process execution monitoring, what you have to do is hook at very noisy places in the kernel. So for example, you need to hook on the open syscall or on the exec VA syscall, which are, you know, syscalls that are technically called all the time, right? And if you do that, this means that you might have a significant overhead if you do not do any, um, you know, any filtering. So what I mean by overhead is actually two different things. The first one is kernel overhead. So when you actually run an UPPF program, the program with, will uh, introduce some kind of latency um, for the syscall, which means that the syscall will answer slower than it, uh, than it would without the UPPF program. So that's the first overhead. And the second one is in user space, um, because you know, the system probe or the security agent binaries will actually you know, um, require resources, and this will uh, put pressure on the host, right? So you want to reduce those two overheads. And to do that, the very, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, what if you just have one of them, right? <laughs> and to do that, you just simply need to filter things out as much as possible in kernel space. So this is why um, we use the security policies to uh, actually compute in kernel filters and then push those filters in kernel space as early as possible. So the, the process is very simple, as you can see. The first thing is, uh, you know, when the agent starts, you would um, begin by, um, you know, load all the policies and compute all the different filters and then use an eBPF map to push uh, those different the values of the different filters in kernel space. So it's a pretty complicated and sensitive task because um, messing up will actually uh, potentially lead to a bypass, right? So for example, if we take the, the rule that we had earlier, um, we were interested in uh, you know, uh, files in var log, for example. And if you decide to filter out all the files that are, um, you know, that, that which path start with var, for example, you will basically <laughs> you know, filter out everything that you care about. So those different filters are, um, yeah, it's very a sensitive task. So you need to, to be very careful um, about what you push and how you push those different filters. Um, and yeah, so another, so the last part is um, how does it really work, right? So you have those different filters. Um, how do we actually evaluate the rules and how does it work? So basically when you do an open syscall, um, Eventually, you will trigger the one or, or multiple of the different eBPF probes that we use um, with the runtime security agent. So those probes will, probes will trigger and will start by looking at the um, you know, arguments of the syscall or the different data that is in kernel space to try to understand what happened and why uh, those, I mean, you know, one specific file is being opened or why, or why a process was started. And um, based on the different features that we have, the, our EBPF programs will decide if a user space evaluation is required or not. And this is how we, I mean, this is at this stage, we filter out a lot of noise. And this is how we uh, ensure that the the performances are as, as good as possible, right? Um, so if the EPPF programs decide that we should do a user space evaluation, then the uh, event will be written into a perf buffer. And then the user space program, so system probe, will eventually you know, read the data from the buffer um, and run an actual evaluation against the different rules that you have in your policies. And again, if they will match, then you will send it to the security agent and eventually um, it will go to the security monitoring products uh, in the backend. So um, yeah, that's basically it for runtime security. Great. Um, thanks. And thanks, thanks both. Uh, we're finishing uh, now. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, drop it on the Q&A button. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, I would like to, to finish. I would like to ask Guillaume and, and Lee. Uh, so eBPF, uh, as we've seen uh, for the security monitoring, for example, and network monitoring use cases is super useful. Um, many more use cases uh, are being added in every uh, kernel. So there are a lot of people wanting to, to learn eBPF and how to write programs. So um, Lee, what, what would be your recommendation for people willing, willing to start? I would start with a tool called BPF Trace, which is an open source tool maintained by IOVisor. So it's a, a DSL that lets you build BPF um, tools in 
a much shorter turnaround time than you would if you were doing it doing it with with C. Um, so there are just like tons of useful one liners and five liners that let you get at useful information and really show you what B BF can do. Cool. What about yeah, you, Yum? What would be your recommendation? Yeah, definitely a tool like BPF traces is super useful. And um, and also at the same time, I would also recommend to, uh, you know, to not be scared to deep dive into the kernel. Um, basically, you know, you will uh, you will only understand the true power of BPF if you actually use it and if you actually build new tools, right? And to do that, you need to know where to go and you need to, to know where to hook in the kernel. So basically deep dive into the code, do not be scared. It's a bit messy sometimes, but eventually things will, ma will make sense. And uh, yeah, hang in there, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Hanging there. That's a very good recommendation. Um, good. So uh, we're done. Uh, if you, thank you very much. Again, Q&A. Don't be shy. Ask as many questions as you want. Uh, if you think these type of problems are interesting to solve, uh, we are hiring. So if you go to datadoghq.com slash careers, you can see uh, our openings. The question is by us, I guess, uh, is there a limit on the size of BPF maps? I assume this would be, the, this would limit the number of security filters that we can create. Uh, yep, absolutely. So two things to say about that. Um, the first one is, first of all, I, I'm not aware of any uh, limits that you can put on the, on the maps, you know, I mean, there is the limit that the process can reserve. So based on that, there is an actual limit. But then if you're a root user, you can actually you know, uh, upgrade the limit to pretty much all the RAM that you want. Um, so we were, for example, able to, you know, just for fun, uh, we were, example, for example, able to, to uh, load uh, you know, perf maps of uh, about one gigabyte of data. So technically, it's, uh, you can do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, that said, you will not want, of course, to uh, you know have two big maps. Otherwise, you will uh, just you know <laughs> destroy the performances of your hosts, and 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 everything you use in UBPF is not usable in user space. Um, for, I mean, for the services of your hosts. So yeah, be careful with that. <laughs> and and just to add on that, the maps are all pre-sized. So when you load the program into the kernel, you need to supply it with a size. So there are no allocations, and you can very easily predict like exactly how much kernel space your, your eBPF program is gonna use. Yep. Good, thanks. Um, so we don't have any more questions. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, the video will be available, as I said, on datadoghq.com and also our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to pass it along to your colleagues, feel free to do so. Um, Thanks again, and we will see you on the next one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.